week two of this brand new series called You Can Do This. Last week we talked about uh, David, David and Goliath, in a sermon that we called You Can Slay. And today we're going to be teaching on this idea that you can stand. And I'm really excited about it today. We're going to be working through the story of these three young men that Scripture lays out as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and some of the implications that we can draw from that story and elsewhere as well. So I'm going to I'm going to have us jump right into Daniel this morning. I'm going to read a passage, pray, and then we're going to jump into it, okay? Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 16. If you have your Bibles, you can also look on your phone. I don't know if that's if you've known that or not, but in verse 16 we read this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, "O Nebuchadnezzar, there's a good name, by the way. If you're naming your kids, consider that little Nebi. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery burning furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, there's the key piece to that verse right there. But if not, let it be known, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I'm excited to jump into today's teaching from this passage. I want us, if we could, just to bow our heads and close our eyes. I want you to up your expectation this morning um, for the fact that God is going to speak to you. A lot of times we drag the whole week in with us, and I understand that. But God has brought you here for a purpose and for a time such as this. Do we believe that? Amen? And so you are here. There's, there's no accident. It's no accident you're here. No matter who you are, where you come from, God has a word for you today. Let's pray. Father, we want to surrender our hearts right now to you. We want to surrender our minds right now to you and center ourselves. When your word tells us that when we exalt Jesus Christ, that he will draw all men, all women unto himself. And so, Father, today we make much of Jesus. We declare that Jesus is the reason we are here. Jesus is the sole purpose of us gathering. It's not about us. It's all about him. May he be glorified in and through us today. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said as powerful and loud as we can. Amen, amen. Well, quick question, just show of hands. How many of you have ever had a bully? Any of you? Maybe when you were younger had a bully? Yeah. Um, I thought I might share a story with you from when I was younger. In fact, I was in fourth grade. I was a little bit shorter. Unfortunately, weighed the same exact amount. But um, yeah, and uh, fourth grade, and, and I had a bully. Now, what took place with this bully was every day at recess when we would go outside to play, uh, he would come and bite me. That's basically what it amount, amounted to. He was consistently biting me. I went to my teachers and I said, hey, yo, this kid keeps biting me all the time. And they'd be like, hey, we don't bite. You know, and I'm, I'm walking away with welts on my leg from this kid biting me. He was just a bully. Sometimes he would punch me. Sometimes he would push me, especially during football. When we were all like piled up, he would bite me all the time. I'm not joking you. This is the worst day, worst thing ever. And so I finally went home to my dad. And I told my dad, I said, this kid won't leave me alone. He keeps punching me. He keeps pushing me. He keeps biting me. What am I supposed to do? My dad told me something that I have not forgotten. And a little bit of a disclaimer, okay? This is not, I'm not giving you parent, parental advice with this, okay? I'm not saying that what my dad told me was necessarily a great idea. I'm just relaying what my dad told me and then what I did, and then the result of that, okay? Are we all on equal expectations and understanding here? Yes? Okay, so I'm not conveying um, parental advice. My dad looked at me and said, well, you know how to deal with a bully, don't you, son? That's what he said. And I knew from the, from the tone of my father's voice that this was going to be good, and I said, no, you know? I had these big Coke bottle glasses, you know, and the spiky hair, and I was, you know, three foot one. And I said, what, dad? You know, I had no idea. And he said, you never back down from a bully. I said, what does that mean? He said, you got to stand your ground. That's what he said. And the moment that my dad said, you've got to stand your ground, I promise you, every prepubescent hair on my arm stood to attention. You know what I mean? I was excited because I knew the next day it was going to go down. 
I knew I had my father's blessing, but I was just a little bit scared because I'd never really stood up to a bully before. So I was just kind of psyching myself up, you know, and, and, and so the next day rolled around and, and we went out to recess and I was looking for it. I was waiting for it. I was psyching myself up. Sure enough, we're playing football and here he comes, our eyes lock, and I see him. You know how all the greatest moments in your life take place in slow motion? You know what I'm talking about? I, I can remember it in slow motion. Here he came. His eyes were locking with mine. I knew he was coming. He looked at my mid-thigh. I knew that's what he was coming for, understandably. And his teeth, he opened his mouth, and it was like the, the mouth of a lion just getting ready to grasp onto its prey. And in one swift move, I allowed him to come close, and as he came close to me, I grabbed a hold of him because he was smaller than me. I picked him up over my head, and I threw him over on the ground. True story. I literally suplexed a fourth grader. Now, in all fairness, I was also a fourth grader, okay? Immediately, he started to cry and ran inside. I was called to the principal's office, and I had no fear with this. I had no problem with this. My dad told me it was okay. So I marched on into the principal's office, you know, and he said, what gives you the right to pick somebody else up and throw them into a parking lot? Because that's where we're playing football. And I said, my dad told me to do it. And he said, well, let's call your father then. And I was like, fine. And so we called my dad. And upon sharing the story, my dad said, Travis, why did you throw that kid across the parking lot? And I said, you told me to, to not back down. You told me to, to, to stand. And he said, I meant tell him to quit bullying you, not to throw him across the yard. And I was like, oh, okay. And I got many, many detentions. So maybe you can relate. Maybe you've thrown a bully across the room. But the point is this, you shouldn't back down from a bully. Amen? You need to stand. And here's what else I know. This story demonstrates the fact that we can stand. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what adds a little bit of depth to the story, we see these three individuals, these three men, as men. And I don't know what you picture when you picture them, but you probably picture somebody in their 20s or 30s. But theologians will tell you, based on a text in Daniel chapter 1, that most likely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were between the ages of 11 and 13. 11 and 13. These aren't men. These are kids. These are boys. These are young boys who were taken hostage by King Nebuchadnezzar when he conquered their land, brought into captivity. He then chose out the, the, the ones that he felt like were the smartest, the most agile, taught them their language, taught them their manners. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are among those three. And they grabbed them as they were children. Daniel is another one of the, of the young men who we'll be discussing in a couple weeks. But these were young boys. And the idea is this. You'll read this in your Sea Life group, by the way. And, and Pastor Seth is right. If you're not in a Sea Life group, what are you doing? You are missing out. That's what our church is. Sunday is just the start for us as a church. You were designed to do Christianity in, in, in a community with people that love you and are going to walk with you regardless of where you are. You need to get into one immediately. And you'll be discussing this. Um, and so you'll kind of see how the story unfolds. But basically it's this. The king of this great nation, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. He creates a gigantic golden statue that when the music plays that they have set aside at certain times of the day, when the music plays, everyone in the kingdom is to bow down and worship the image. Well, the music plays and everyone bows down to worship the image except who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Jews. They worship the one true living God. Well, one of the king's servants runs to the king and says, hey, king, oh king, live forever. Just so you know, three of your elite young men, they are not bowing down. And the king is enraged. Because the penalty for this is death. In fact, the king has gone to the extent to create, extensively create, a furnace where you burn humans alive. Now think about that. This guy was very serious about being worshipped. So much so that if you were unwilling to worship him, you were going to be thrown into a furnace where you would be burned alive. And so the king sends for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They come and stand before the king. And the king says, you of all people, you know the penalty 
for this. It's death. If you do not bow down when the music plays, I will put you in the furnace and you will die. And then we pick this verse up in, in, in 16. Look at these young boys' responses. Can I just stress that again? These 11 to 13-year-old boys' response to this king. They say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. First off, that's a little gutsy. Like, we don't even feel like we need to repeat ourselves. That's basically what they're saying. He says, if this be so, if you choose to throw us in, our God whom we serve is, read this with me, able to deliver us, okay, from the burning furnace, and he, read this with me, will deliver us, okay, out of your hand. But here's the key phrase. Read this with me. But if not, let me hear you say that once, once more. So what they're saying is God is able to, we believe that God will, but even if he doesn't, we're not gonna bow. Now think about the guts. Think about the faith. Think about the fortitude that it would take for somebody to be standing in front of a nation, to be standing in front of a king, and to be standing in front of a burning, fiery furnace. I wonder, just off the top here, how would you have responded? Most of us would have been like, oh, I must have misunderstood. I'll definitely get over there and bow down right now. I mean, come on. We love to read ourselves in as the heroes of the story, but let's just be honest. Most of us would have bowed down, but not these young men. They said, no, 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 king. We know God can save us. We believe that he will, but even if he doesn't, Last week we talked about David and Goliath and the perspective and the mind shift that David clearly possessed that nobody else had at his time. And we said it like this, while everybody else was looking at the weight of the giant, David was looking at the weight of God's glory. These three young men, they had a different mentality as well. And I would say that it is a mentality, it is a, it is a thought process that we are in desperate need of today in our culture and in our time. In fact, if we are to stand strong in our culture, in our day, in our society, we need a new mind. Would you agree? We need a new mind. I love how Paul says it in Romans chapter 12. He says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Look at what he says here. Here's the key. He says, do not be, what's that word? Come on, church, what's that word? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. See how he puts those opposite of each other. He says, don't be like this, be like this. Don't be conformed but be transformed. And then he provides us the bridge from conformity to transformation. He says, don't be conformed, but be transformed. How? By the renewal, that's the bridge, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I want you to know this morning, and I'm kind of excited about it, and I want to encourage you and challenge you in it, I want you to know this morning that the most powerful tool that you have available to you today, apart from the Holy Spirit living in, inside of you, is your mind. The most powerful, and, and dare I say, untapped resource that you have available to you today is your mind. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight our war, our battle is actually against what? principalities, and darkness. Is it any wonder that the enemy engages you and fights with you at a mind level? See, the enemy doesn't have to bind you up physically to get you to be bound. He can bind you up mentally. How many of you know that if you think hard enough, you can make yourself sick? I mean, if how you think about a situation can literally make you sick physically, Sick. I remember so many times, man, being in school, walking into a test unprepared, and all of a sudden I realized I needed to be sick. I was not feeling well. And so the enemy attacks us in these 
places. He will bind up your mind with stress and worry and aggravation. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Self-esteem issues, identity issues, anger, rebellion, aggravation, worry, anxiety, depression. See, he doesn't have to physically hold you down. He's just got to tie up your mind. And if he can tie up your mind, he can tie up your life, which means what? We got to set our minds free. We got to get our minds free. And according to Paul, the way to transformation, the way to life change, the way to get our minds free is through the bridge of renewal. We need a new mind. A new mind requires perspective, a new way of looking at a situation, a new way of looking at our circumstances. And here's what I would say. To the one who can handle the change of mind, to the one who can handle the shift in perspective, when you shift your mind, when you shift your perspective, you can begin to see problems in your life not as struggles but as opportunities that God is going to demonstrate his glory through. Man, you ever have those friends that just no matter what, it's a bad day? No matter what, it's drama. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you wouldn't say amen because you came with them today. I don't know. I don't know. We've all got those friends. Everything's bad all the time, Eeyore. I mean, all the time, every day. You don't even want to ask how you're doing because you, before you even finish it, they're like, oh, it's a bad day. This is happening. This is ha-. Like, we all have, what I'm telling you is we need a mind shift. We need a thought shift. We're only into February of 2019. Don't waste a new year on an old mind. Don't waste an entire new year with an old mindset that you brought with you. Don't do it. Just don't. And I'm telling you this, as soon as you stop looking for answers in other people, as soon as you stop waiting around for something to change in your situation, how many of you have been waiting for years for your situation to change only to have it stay the same or get worse? Huh? Stop. Stop waiting for your situation to change and start taking the hill of your mind. Stop living defensively. Man, it makes me so frustrated when I see Christian men and women that have the power of God inside of them living in a defensive position. You are better than that. You can do this. You're better than that. Stop allowing life to happen to you. I'm not invalidating your physical sickness. I'm not invalidating your emotional struggle. I'm not invalidating the fact that he left you or she cheated. I'm not invalidating that those are real things. They really hurt. But I'm also saying that if you shift your perspective, you can get out of that situation as a struggle and see it as a way for God to build you and bring him glory. That's how we're called to live. Victoriously. Stop being a victim of what happens to you. Start taking control. I'm just preaching. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 12 tells us, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. See, there is a way in which the Christian can live where if he is not proactive, he will just conform. And that's what I'm trying to tell you today. If you just live your life, you will conform to this life. If you don't take action. See, transformation takes action. It takes you moving somewhere. Point number two, stop conforming and start transforming. Here's the question. How do we do this? Like, it would be a shame if I just said, do this, and I don't tell you how to do this. Well, I would say this. We need a new equation. We need a new equation. Here's how most people, I would say, operate. They take their feelings about a thing, plus their circumstances surround a thing, and that determines their actions towards a thing. Another way that you could say it, if you're taking notes, feelings plus circumstance equals action. That's how most people live. The problem is that's a defensive way of living. How I feel about it, what's taking place, then that's going to determine what I do. That's a defensive mentality. Are you, are, are, you, are, you, are you with me? Are you tracking? Does this make sense? Yes? You can see how most of us do this, most people in life. That means that, that, means that your feelings are determined by your circumstance. You see why that's a problem, right? Like, I don't want my feelings determined by a circumstance. In fact, really, I don't want to have to deal with my feelings at all. If I could get up and out of my feelings, that'd probably be best because my feelings can flex. My feelings are in flux. They fluctuate. So here's a new equation for your life. Scripture 
plus action equals obedience. Scripture plus action equals obedience. I love, I love the simplicity. I love it. I love the simplicity of this. I love this mentality because it means this, regardless of my situation, listen to me now, regardless of my circumstance, I can be confident. Regardless of my situation, I can stand strong. Regardless of what happens to me, regardless of what sickness, regardless of what death in my family or financial issue, regardless of that, my faith is rooted in God's words, regardless, because what God tells me is more important than how I feel. You're like, I don't agree with that. Well, let me tell you why I feel you're wrong. What God tells me is more important than how I feel. I already told you, our feelings fluctuate. God doesn't. Do you want to put your faith in something that's moving around all the time? Or do you want to place your faith in something that is true, has always been true, will always be true? I choose to put my faith, my truth, in God and in his hands because he will never change. Amen? Amen. And so what God says, listen, listen, listen. What God says is more important than how I feel. Live it out. Because God knows we need this. We live in Ohio. I mean, a couple days ago, it was 65 degrees. I woke up feeling great. I woke up, and I'm like, maybe I should get out the lawnmower. Maybe I should do some workouts. Man, what a great day. I'm skipping. I went and got the kids donuts. I mean, it's a great day. I woke up the next morning. It was 17 degrees. I didn't skip around much that day. I think uh, I was in a bad mood. Why? Because the feelings move. Why would you place your decisions or your actions? Why would you base them off of your feelings or your circumstances? And yet this is what we do. Listen to me, Christian. God has called us to be on the offensive. Stop living defensively. Stop it. You are better than that. You're better than that. You are. Stop it. And I'm not going to react to my circumstances and situations. I'm going to be obedient and keep the faith in spite of them. Even Paul, arguably the greatest Christian alive, he says it like this in chapter 7 of Romans. He says, I don't understand my own actions because I end up doing what I want. uh, Because I don't, I'm sorry, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul, one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, says, I don't really trust myself. I end up doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things I should do. Why? Because too often we live out of this mentality. This is what allowed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, regardless of what you do, regardless of what you say, king, regardless of the threats that you make, I'm going to do me. Regardless, you can say you're going to throw me. You can say you're going to chop me up. You can say you're going to kill me. You can say you're going to embarrass me. Regardless of what you do, I have to believe in what God says. Do you see the power in that? What can this world do to somebody who says, regardless of what you do, I'm going to be obedient? Because what God says is more important than how I feel. And what God says is more important than anything that you could do. Do you see how that removes the power from a situation immediately? And yet we choose Not to live this way. I'm telling you, renew your mind. Renew your mind. You want to transform your life? Renew your mind. Renew it. Now, I'm trying to make this painfully practical, okay? And here are the steps. I believe painfully practical in renewing your mind. I want you to write these down. Number one, read. Number one, read. You say, Travis, what do you mean by read? Pick up your Bible, open it up, put your eyeballs on it, and read the words. Now, Joshua chapter 1 says this, verse 8, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The first part, the first step to, to renewing our mind is Read. Look at your neighbor and say, you better read. You better read. Yeah. Now, here's, okay, you know what? Can I just be really, really honest with you for a minute? Is that okay? Can I be super honest? Yeah. 
<laughs> like two of you were like, yeah, okay. Um, I want to say this correctly, uh, but, but I really feel, okay, I'm just going to say this. S- like, stop making excuses as to why you don't read Scripture. Stop. Because here's what I hear a lot. I just don't know where to begin. Now, that might have been a decent excuse like 150, 250 years ago. The problem is we are in a free country surrounded by people that are willing to talk with you with phones that have entire books of the Bible in multiple translations and languages available to us with search engines that allow us literally to type in where should I start reading the Bible and it will give you more answers than you could read for your, in, in your entire life. Stop making excuses as to why you don't read. Stop. You are better than that. Stop. Read. There are Bible plans. There are small groups. There are sea life groups. There's a worship experience. Every, like there is no reason. Be proactive and read. Joshua says that we are to read both day and night. We are to meditate on God's word. In other words, he's saying you should think about the words of God. Daily meditation in God's word is what allows daily meditation on God's word. You want to know why you probably don't think about God's word? Maybe it's because you're not spending enough time in God's word. If you want, if you were like, man, I wish I was like holy like my friend. Like, I feel like things happen to them and they're just spitting out verses. They're just like riding, riding, you know, they're like the eagle. They soar over the sword, whatever, okay? It's probably because they're spending time in God's word. What you put in, you're going to get out. So if you're only ever putting in the walking dead, guess what's going to come out of you? Probably not scripture, right? Like, like, let's just be honest. I'm not trying to play the old pastor guilt trip. I mean, a little bit. But, you know, you know, like, we're like, we don't have time. I don't have time. But you just binge watched the entire season of fill in the blank on Netflix. Like, what'd you do this weekend? Did you go out? No, man, I just, ended, I got so wrapped up in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that series. I ended up watching like four seasons. Oh, did you read scripture? No, man, I've just, you know how it is. I'm just so busy, you know? Okay, read. You want to renew your mind? Read. Number two, number two, recognize. Recognize. Second, recognize the source. This is where we start fighting, okay? This is where we start fighting. You need to recognize the source of self-focused and self-defeating thoughts in your own life, okay? Scripture tells us in Proverbs 23 and KJV, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It actually says it like this, as a man thinketh. I like that. Sounds, you put a little bit of mustard on it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I'm gonna say something that might kind of sound odd to you, but I truly believe. Thoughts are things, Now, we don't think about thoughts in that way, but I want you to know that thoughts are actually things. I I, I know that might sound strange to you, but your thoughts are things, and I say that because your thoughts will shape your reality. So consider what your thoughts, where your thoughts come from. Consider where they come from. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 to take every thought into captivity and to make it obedient to Christ. Now, what does this actually mean, taking every thought into, uh, into, uh, into captivity? Why is that important? Why is it important that we recognize the source? Well, because it's either from God or it's not. If it's a godly thought, allow it to permeate inside of you. If it's a thought that's from the enemy, it's a thought, if it's a thought that's from the flesh, Reject it. Thoughts are things. They will shape who you become. They will shape your habits. They will shape your mood. They will shape your relationship. They will shape your value. You have a problem with gossip? Stop trying to stop gossiping. Start taking your thoughts into captivity. There's never a time when you begin to have the urge to gossip where God's like, oh, I feel like that's okay for that she gossips this time. Like, that's never, like, that's never okay. And so if we begin recognizing the source of our thoughts, we, be, we can become uh, powerful in taking in only what God would have for us. Do you see what I'm saying? How many times do you do this? How many times are you getting ready in the morning? You walk up to the mirror and you're like, whoa. 
train wreck today. What is going on? Now, I know that doesn't happen to any of you. It happens to me every once in a while, once or twice a year. I look, I'm like, whoa, what is this? Where did this go, you know? And then I won't stop that. I won't. In fact, then I'll start looking at other things, and I'm like, whoa, why do you look this way, Travis? What's going on? And, oh, uh, you know, and then I'll walk out, and I'll be dressed for the day, and then that thought will still be in my head, and so that's the the view that I have of myself, and then, and then I'll be like, man, I, I really thought I'd be in a different place in my life, like physically at this point in my life, like I remember what my dad looked like, and then that thought is like, oh, I remember my dad, like I wonder if I'm a good dad, you know, I don't know that I'm a good dad, you know, I got really mad at my kids this week, and my wife was there, oh, what's going on with my wife, I wonder if my wife, anybody else? Then I get in my car, and it doesn't turn over as fast as I need it to, and I'm like, oh, now I'm going to have to get a new car, isn't this the way this always happens, what's going on with my car, oh man, I bet I'm going to die on the way to work, I mean, like literally that's where it ends. I bet I'm going to die. I bet I'm going to die. That's where it ends. But where does it start? It starts with me not taking captive my thoughts. Me not recognizing where those thoughts came from. That, that thought is not from God. Hey, Travis, you look like a train wreck today. That's not a thought from God. You need to recognize the source of self-focused and self-defeating thoughts. So number one, read. Number two, consider the source. Where are these thoughts coming through? Number three, practical now, replace. Read, replace. I'm sorry, read, recognize, and replace. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse 22 says this. For he who, is called, for he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave to Christ. Now, when we read this on the nose, I know it can be a little bit confusing. I know it can, because it might look like there's a loss of freedom. But what I'm telling you is that your mind is going to be a slave of yourself, slave to yourself, or a slave to Christ. And so the only way to free your mind is to beat it into submission, into the submission that it requires. Your mind must become a slave to be free. Free from oppression, free from hatred, free from anxiety, free from stress, free from worry. Replace self-focused thinking and self-defeating thinking with a God-focused mindset. Oh, I wish you would get that today. I wish we would get that as a church today. Replace self-focused thinking and self-defeated thinking with a God-focused mentality, a God-focused mindset. What does God say about us? Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Romans 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What I'm telling you is to literally take the words of God and replace your thoughts with them. Replace your thoughts with them. If you want your mind renewed, start dwelling on what God says instead of what you say. If you want your view of yourself to change, stop looking in the mirror and start checking in God's word. Because in God's word, he tells me that I'm loved. In God's word, he tells me that I'm accepted. In God's word, he tells me that I'm worthy, regardless of how he abused me, regardless of what she said, regardless of how they left me, regardless of my circumstance or situation, God's word matters more than how I feel. That's the only way we're going to renew our mind. That's the only way. Otherwise, you're going to be a slave to yourself, a slave to your emotions, a slave to the weather. A slave to your favorite sports team, losing. Now here's what I know. This is why this is so tough. It's tough on a number of levels. But it's hard because for some of us, it's been so long since we've tasted victory. Hasn't it? 
I mean, I get it. I'm a Browns fan. I get it. Probably more than most. I mean, it's been years. In fact, there was a season ago that we didn't even win a game. We didn't, we didn't win a game. You know? And after game five, you're like, man, I forget what it's even like to win. I forget what it's like to, to run off the field and have that sensation of, I did this, we did this, we won. For some of you, you have not tasted victory in a long, long time. And you have allowed life to hit you, to bite you, to beat you. And you might say, well, what's wrong with this, Travis? Just leave me alone. Let me wallow in my self-pity. You know why that's a problem? Because you've actually begun to believe the lies the enemy has told you about yourself. You've begun to believe that your marriage can't change. You've begun to believe that he doesn't love you anymore. You've begun to believe that you're not smart. You've begun to believe that God has left you. You've begun to believe that it can't get any better. You've begun to believe that you can't be healed. You began to believe at some point in time, and you took it on, that you were no good, that you were worthless. And what felt so good at first, and just wallowing in that, because you got sympathy from friends, and, and, and it got you some attention, now has become this dark pit that you cannot escape. And Paul says... Don't be conformed. Transform yourself by renewing your mind. See, how do we get out of that pit? Oftentimes, we're just, we're waiting for th someone to throw down a rope. The problem is you're standing in the pit with your Savior. You don't need a rope. You have the King of all creation standing right next to you. That's it. And it takes a moment. It just takes a moment. Read. Recognize. Replace. And let's make it even more practical. What do you mean by replace? I mean this. Know God's word so well that when you have a thought come into your mind, you quote scripture back at it. You quote scripture back at it. You feel like God's led you to an opportunity. Listen now. You feel like God's leading you to an opportunity. It takes a little bit of faith to step out. All of a sudden you get that self-doubt. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't do this. That's going to be challenging. Or somebody says you can't do that. And all of a sudden that thought comes in your mind. Maybe I can't do this. What do you say? You know what you say? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You want to fight? That's how you fight. But you got to have the right tools to fight. The right tools are... God's word. No wonder Ephesians 6 compares it to a sword. No, no, matter if, no, no wonder if he, uh, Hebrews 4.12 says it's like a two-edged sword. Why? Because it is. It's how we fight. You're trying to fight with everything else. Stop it. Just fight with the weapon that God gave you. Read, recognize, replace, and lastly, and important here, rest. Read, recognize, replace, rest. Romans 8. There is therefore, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I'm telling you, if we truly understood the implications of this, we would be out of our seats right now, screaming in victory. Did you see what that said? Look at what it says. Romans 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What does that mean? A conversation with, our, with, a, with one of our Sea Life groups this last week where they said, the question was asked, how much sin has Jesus forgiven when you meet Jesus? And somebody said, all the sins that you've sinned up to this point, Jesus has forgiven those. I said, okay. Somebody else said, I think the sin that Jesus forgives when you come to Jesus, when you surrender your life, you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he forgives all your old sins and anything you're sinning with right now. And then somebody said, no, that couldn't make sense. It can't make sense that Jesus would have forgiven all those sins and, and these sins. Jesus actually, to forgive you fully, would have had to have forgiven those sins, these sins, and all the sins that I have not yet sinned. And that is completely correct. 
The moment that you come to Christ, oh man, get this, get this. The moment that you come to Christ, Jesus Christ takes away the sin of the past, the sin of the present, and the sin of the future. And that is why Paul can say there's not any more condemnation. Why? Because I'm already forgiven. There's nothing for me to be judged over. It's already been paid for. Therefore, I can stand fully in front of God. What can this world do? What can I do? Nothing. It's been paid for. And so because of that, I can rest. I can rest. My my, my history is forgiven, and my future is secure. What can this world do? You're going to throw me in a furnace? Throw me in. Throw me in. It's better on the other side, man. I got bills. You got bills. I'm going to die, and somebody's going to pay for them. I mean, I got bills. It's better on the other side. You see what I'm saying? Read, recognize, replace, rest. Resting is such a lost art. Sometimes you rest and people call you lazy. There's a difference between rest and laziness. Rest is strategic. Rest is intentional. Rest is something that scripture says we are wise to do. Rest takes faith. It it takes faith to say, I'm not going to work any harder on this. I'm going to take a moment to rest. You can take that pause in your life because you have full confidence in Christ. How do we renew? We read, we recognize, we replace, we rest. 